What is going on, guys? Thank you so much for stopping by the channel. I got a little bit of extra for you. It is July 4th, 2021. I am JD from New York. No full-fledged off-the-script podcast this weekend, being that it is a holiday weekend. We'll be back at full strength again starting on Monday for a brand new week of content. Make sure you guys follow me on social media at JD from NY206. That is Twitter and Instagram. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on the bell for all notifications. Hit that thumbs up as well on the video down below. And if you guys missed any of the content on the channel this week already, we got Monday Night Raw, we got AEW Dynamite, we got the Friday Night Smackdown, all the live streams are there on the homepage. And then yesterday we had an off the script extra going into further detail about the return of Zelina Vega, her deleting her unionization tweet and WWE officials actually apologizing to her as she made her return on SmackDown on Friday night. But I got more news and rumors right now, today, for you guys. We're going to start at the top. WWE to tape the final Thunderdome episode of Raw. They are doing it in advance. WrestleVos reported earlier this week that the final live show from the Thunderdome will be on July 9th of Friday Night SmackDown. WWE plans to tape the July 12th episode of Monday Night Raw one week before. Looks like they can't wait to get out of the Thunderdome and away from those virtual geeks either. Looks like WWE's final show inside the Thunderdome will be Friday, July 9th. That will be a live episode of SmackDown on Fox. The July 12th episode of Raw will be the final Thunderdome show. However, will be taped the week Prior, end quote. That is what WrestleVote said on Twitter. The first show back with fans in attendance is SmackDown on July 16th in Houston, Texas. Then the company holds Money in the Bank on July 18th from Fort Worth, Texas, and Raw the following night in Dallas. The company came up with the Thunderdome idea after holding shows for months from the WWE Performance Center, which is now the Capitol Wrestling Center, the home of NXT. When the COVID-19 pandemic first started, it was an empty arena show, then WWE used the Performance Center recruits as fans. And then last August, right around SummerSlam time, the Thunderdome was introduced with fans appearing on LED screens. I am so fucking happy that we're finally getting back to normal, man. We're not going to be seeing these virtual geeks cheering on the Thunderdome screens. We're not going to be hearing any piped in fucking chants. This is awesome. Drew, 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 and... Drew McIntyre comes out on Monday Night Raw. We're not going to be hearing Roman sucks chants. And the worst part of it all, these performers, they're asked to acknowledge this, even though we know it is piped in audience. It sucks. I can't wait to not hear anything that is piped in from WWE ever again, man. I know some people don't like the CM Punk chants. I know some people don't like the what chants. I know people in the community loathe those chants. But man, oh man, is it much better than what we got in these Thunderdome shows. Seriously. And the worst part about it all, and I mentioned this quite a few times, is that WWE has pretty much built a safety net around themselves with these Thunderdome shows. You know, they are giving you exactly what they want. Come July 16th, they are not in control anymore. Yeah, we've seen Kevin Dunn and WWE production mute certain things, alter things when they upload the raw footage to YouTube, pretending like something didn't happen live while changing it because they want you to think a certain way on YouTube when you watch it back or they just omit it completely as if it never fucking existed. Listen, WWE has done that more than I care to remember, especially with Roman Reigns and their agenda to push him as a top babyface when nobody really wanted him as a top babyface. But WWE has lived in this safety net for close to a year now. When the fans are back in attendance, that is who you're going to need to listen to, man. They are going to be the eyes and ears of what WWE needs to be doing on Monday and Friday night. They're going to tell you who they want to see, who they don't want to see, what they like, what they don't like. We don't have that right now. WWE is simply giving you what they want you to like. So I can't wait for the roles to be reversed here. 
Typically, WWE doesn't listen to their fans, even though Stephanie McMahon and all this management have come out and say, WWE, they, they listen to their fans. The fans are the lifeblood of WWE. We follow them. They are the winds of change or whatever the fucking excuse is that they come up with. So I can't wait, man. This safety net, this bubble that they've been living in, that they've been living in, gone. Completely gone. I can't fucking wait. Thunderdome, goodbye. I never want to see another fucking virtual geek on a screen ever again. Latest on the WWE's mandate for talent as they head to live events with fans. It was reported earlier this month that the main roster talent was informed by the company that a new edict has been issued regarding them expecting to come to the Performance Center over the next few weeks to take part in workouts in the ring to better prepare themselves for the return of touring. This happened on Tuesday, according to Fightful Select this week. The report stated that many performers that have been off television for quite a while made the trip to the Performance Center. Now, those people that WWE typically doesn't want to give TV time to, they're going to be needed because they're going back on tour, and WWE is going to be giving those that they haven't used on television work now because they have to fill out these live shows. So that is the reason why they want everybody to get that ring rust off and Get back out there and work the WWE style, work the cameras, know what to do, know where this is, know where that is, know your cues on how WWE likes to produce what they do. So I don't blame them for that. I really don't. This is a good edict. This is one of the few edicts that I actually do agree with from Vince McMahon. So this happened on Tuesday. Former SmackDown Women's Champion Sasha Banks was among the names who hasn't been featured on television and was asked to come to the Performance Center. I think Sasha Banks would be there even if she wasn't asked. She'd go there because that's the type of work work ethic that Sasha Banks has. Banks worked, worked her last match at WrestleMania 37 where she dropped the SmackDown Women's title to Bianca Belair, who has since gone on and feuded with Bayley for the last three pay-per-views. Vince McMahon is expected, obviously, to... Uh, Make some decisions following his Performance Center visit, which happened on Thursday. He was scouting talent, which was the belief. I'm not really sure I believe that, but that is the going rumor. As we have a draft coming up after SummerSlam, and Vince wanted a first-hand look at what is going on in the Performance Center, and he wanted to see who is ready, who he wants, who could be a benefit to him on the main roster, which I have news on in just a little bit. But that is WWE's mandate. Even the top of the top in the WWE is asked to come down to the Performance Center and train and wipe off that ring rust. Some people have gotten lazy. But this was the benefit of working in front of these Thunderdome geeks. WWE should have always been preparing for something to go back to normal. You know, things to go back to normal. But, hey, I'm not going to complain. If WWE wants their talent to do a little bit of extra training, you know, they have every fucking right to, man. The roster, though it's been beneficial to them, and probably a lot easier on their lives and a lot easier on their bodies. You know, they have been taken out of the typical norm for well over a year now. So to ask them to go to the Performance Center and do a little bit of extra training to get back and be ready in front of fans, I mean, WWE really isn't asking much of them. It should be mandatory. They should want to do that on their own. So if the company's saying, yeah, this is mandatory, you got to go do it, I don't think I would really like it if I was Vince McMahon to hear any lip about, oh, why do I got to go? Why do I need this? Everybody should be on the same page, man. You're all equals there. This is something that should should be done no matter what. You've had a, a lot of easy time in the middle of the pandemic, man. Yeah, there's been ups and downs. Yeah, there's been negatives. But the, the amount of work that has been done for these pro wrestlers on Monday and Friday night, wrestling one day a week, no live shows. You don't got to really do anything. You wrestle on your show, you go home for the rest of the week, you prepare and do what you got to do for the next week. This is a mandatory thing that should not be a problem for anybody, honestly. So this is one of the few edicts, like I said before, that I absolutely agree with Vince McMahon on. One of the bigger names to come out of the pandemic was Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre reportedly said he plans to convince WWE to bring back his old theme music, Broken Dreams, that he used during his first run in WWE. He was asked about this during an appearance on the Battleground podcast. No familiarity with that podcast, but he poked fun at Sheamus, saying people he or saying people want his previous theme song back, written on my face to come back. McIntyre referred to it as Lobsterhead. 
I don't see anyone asking for lobster head. Everyone's asking for broken freaking dreams. One of these days, that music is going to come back. I hear this question all the time. I see it every day on social media. One of these days, I'm going to get it approved. Have it for a show. I'm positive we still have the rights to it. Everybody in the crowd better know the words to that song because I go out there and people are like, what's that? I'm going to be let down. Everyone start learning the lyrics because eventually I will get that song and I'll ensure Seamus will never have Lobster Head as his theme song again. End quote. Jeff Hardy, he has no more words coming back later this month when WWE returns to live event touring. You know, the one thing, and I think everybody really agrees with everybody that says it, WWE's theme music is fucking generic as shit. It is some of the worst theme music I've ever heard in any pro wrestling genre, honestly. AEW has so much going for themselves as far as who they got writing their music and what they're doing with their theme music, man. When you hear an AEW theme, even Tony Khan has gone out there and bought rights to certain themes that fit pro wrestlers perfectly. Look at Moxley. We didn't like it when it came out to Wild Thing, but it fits him perfectly. And look at Jungle Boy coming out to that song. I mean, it, it just makes the superstar even greater. That's where WWE has failed. They don't realize how big of an influence a theme music is to building a certain star. I would put it in the top three, honestly, things. It, it may be one of the most important things, period. Theme music. It could be placed at the top if you ask, you know, a number of people. It's going to vary all over the map. But theme music is absolutely one of the most important things you could possibly do to build somebody and build somebody up to be a superstar. WWE doesn't have that going for them right now. I don't know who they got writing their music. Def Rebel, I believe it is. Some people's music is okay. But you look at the likes of an Adam Cole or a Kyle O'Reilly or what they did to Keith Lee. I mean, it's fucking ridiculous. Then you got some CFO money theme music still floating around like Matt Riddle and Bianca Belair and Shinsuke Nakamura, Shayna Baszler, guys like that. And it, it fits beautifully with them. You know, they wrote with the character in mind. All of their music that they wrote and gave to certain performers, they all had identity. That's why I like AEW's music so much more than WWE. Mikey Ruckus over there writes with identity in mind. I mean, look at Christian. He, mim he mimicked, almost mirrored his TNA theme. And that's a great fucking theme song for Christian Cage. Sting, look at what he did with Sting. I mean, the guy's work speaks for itself. He writes with identity in mind. No one song sounds the same compared to somebody else. You don't got fucking, you know, wrestler A sounding like wrestler B over in AEW. Everybody has unique theme music. Might not be the best ever. It's not Jim Johnston level, but he's doing a great job over there. So if WWE wants to bring back No More Words, which is great, it's going to make him stand out. It's going to make Jeff Hardy bigger than he is now and has been for quite some time. Same thing with Drew McIntyre. You don't think he's stale? You don't think his theme music has anything to do with him being stale? You hear that theme music on Monday Night Raw, you want to change the channel. You hear that theme music on Monday Night Raw, it's, oh my God, moan and groan. Is Here comes Drew McIntyre. His theme music sucks. We've heard it all through the pandemic, every single week, especially with the, with the booking of him lately, which fucking sucks. You're going to attribute one with the other, and you don't care. So if WWE brings back Broken Dreams, it may actually make him into a bigger star and it actually could benefit him as a whole character-wise. But they don't realize that. They don't care. They really don't care. I hope to see it. Hopefully he's right. If he says something, I would like to think that the wheels are in motion for something like that to be done for Drew McIntyre. Speaking of Keith Lee, I mentioned Keith Lee before and how WWE has royally fucked him up. Mia Yim provides an update on Keith Lee, but not really. Not really. Mia Yim was recently a guest on Devon Dudley's Table Talk podcast and provided a positive but unrevealing update on Keith Lee. She said, he's doing good. He's doing good. I'm not going to comment much about it until he says some stuff, but he's doing good. End quote. That's pretty much it. Wow. Hard-hitting question with barely any answer at all from Mia Yim. Keith Lee hasn't commented much about his absence, but he has asked for fans to be patient until he is able to tell his story. He posted a picture from one of his final independent wrestling matches, which was very cryptic in a way. And I don't remember what he said 
in actually I'm gonna I'm gonna look at it right now. We're gonna type in Keith Lee. I'm gonna look at it because it was very telling what he posted on Twitter. And he says in that quote, here it is. I think he posted a picture of his final independent appearance. I don't think this was the end of one of my final matches over in Europe before joining WWE, but I really don't know what to expect or didn't know what to expect back then. As I reflect on this moment, I realize it's all still the same. A fight. Hashtag grind well. Hashtag legion. Hashtag bask in my glory. I am limitless. No, he's actually limited. But he posted a picture of, of one of his final matches ever over in Europe. Why would you do that? What are you trying to tell people? Do you want to go back to the indies? I mean, he looked great in this picture. If you guys go look at his Twitter page. I mean, does he want to go back to the indies? Is he giving people a hint of what his possible plans are? It's all a fight. What, what are you fighting for? This is what we want to know. You know, you, you don't take somebody off television. You don't disappear for seven months and then not expect people to fucking ask questions. I don't understand the the severity of, uh, of what's going on here. She's not talking. He's not talking. Are they not legally able to talk? Is it really the trademark issue that was brought to light a couple of weeks ago? I don't get it. I'm still in the boat of they took him off TV because he didn't fit the mold of what they wanted. And I honestly believe they took him off TV because they wanted him, management, Bruce, Vince, and everybody else back there, wanted him to lose weight. Meanwhile, I, I don't really get it. I don't really get what they're trying to do. They had a winner in Keith Lee. You had somebody that you didn't need to do any changing for. And you tried to change him into the next Mark Henry, the next Kane. You wanted him to work a big man style. But that, that's not what brought him to the fucking dance. What brought him to the dance is what he did on the indies. You might not think it's a WWE style, but this is how they love to change when they don't really need to change. Keith Lee was on his way to being a superstar. Go watch the Survivor Series where he was left by himself for Team NXT against Roman Reigns. Don't tell me that they needed to change him. He was over then, and he would have been over if they just kept the same formula. I don't really understand why WWE sabotages their talent for the sake of sabotage. It's almost as if they get off on it. I don't know what's going on with him. I hope he's in good health. I hope it's not a health reason. I really hope, hope it's not. But the fact that they're not talking, you know, yeah, they have right to their privacy, but when you take somebody as talented and as hungry as fans are for somebody like Keith Lee to be the future of WWE, he was somebody that everybody looked forward to seeing because he he was one of those guys that really just embodied change, you know? So when you get the fans asking questions and they get mad at it, what the fuck you get mad at them for? It shows that they care. Something ain't right here. Something ain't right here. I don't know who's wrong, but something seems off. Something seems off. I would not be surprised if he ends up getting released, to be quite honest with you. There's another set of releases. I'm not surprised. I wouldn't be surprised Keith Lee's a part of that, that set of people released from the company. I don't know. I don't know. But Keith Lee, man, I'm hoping he comes back, but it ain't looking, it ain't looking good. It's not looking good for Mr. Limited Keith Lee. And me and him is doing no good giving vague, very vague answers to those types of questions. Vince McMahon was at the Performance Center on Thursday. Backstage reaction to Vince's visit at the Performance Center. PW Insider reports that McMahon was there with Nick Khan, Bruce Pritchard, and People Power, Johnny Laurinaitis. They met with staff and observed some of the training. Prior to the visit, there were a lot of concerns uh, about this visit and that this visit was going to lead to more cuts since the company has been making so many cuts in recent months across all departments. PW Insider noted that the visit was positive and one person who was there described it as quote-unquote breath of fresh air. It was a breath of fresh air, so at least among some, there was not as much concern as there was earlier in the day before they all arrived. What exactly was a breath of fresh air, man? You do realize that this report and whoever said this to PW Insider is full of shit. It was not a breath of fresh air. 
Everybody was fucking walking on eggshells when they arrived. Whether they were about to pull people for the main roster, when they were not ready or they did not want to go, or whether they were about to lose their job. How was this, or how was this visit deemed a breath of fresh air among some? Who exactly gave Mike Johnson and PW Insider this fucking scoop? Who was it that said breath of fresh air? Probably was in somebody, it was probably somebody in Vince McMahon's camp that said it. Oh, it's a breath of fresh air that we're out of Titan Tower. It's a breath of fresh air that we got to leave fucking smog-filled Connecticut to go down to the, the fucking humidity of Orlando and the performance center. Hey, look, professional wrestling is happening in front of our, uh, in front of our eyes instead of fucking burying somebody in the boardrooms over at Titan Tower. So who said it was a breath of fresh air? Nobody in the performance center. Nobody that works down in NXT said it was a breath of fresh air. I don't believe that story for a single solitary fucking second. With that said, PW Insider has heard that more cuts could be coming in the weeks to come, but nobody knows what brand or department in the company will be affected. That was the reason for the entire trip. Why would Vince McMahon bring Nick Khan to the goddamn fucking performance center if this wasn't about cutting departments and cutting salary. Now, if this was a talent scout mission, Vince could have been there with Bruce and Johnny People Power only. He didn't need Nick Khan. What, what the fuck does Nick Khan have to do about scouting talent? He don't give a fuck about scouting talent. Clearly, he doesn't know what the fuck is going on that he, ha that he hired Adnan. We're going to need a bigger boat, Verk for the Monday Night Raw play-by-play -play commentary position. I think we don't need him in any more creative decisions from this point moving forward, okay? But if this was a scouting mission, why the fuck would Nick Khan be there? They walked around the Performance Center, they're looking at how many departments are here, where are they gonna cut? That's why he's there. He got a first-hand glimpse of what is going on. He's got it in the back of his mind when he needs to cut more budget. Hey, Vince, remember that trip to the Performance Center? We're going to cut this department out because I don't think we need it. That's exactly what's going to happen. They weren't there to scout talent. They've been scouting talent and calling people from the Performance Center to go backstage at Raw, go backstage at SmackDown. They've been holding their own fucking scouting uh, talent sessions, own tryouts before Monday and Friday night. The fuck they need to go down there for? Anybody that believes that they went down there to scout talent is a complete blithering idiot, if you ask me, man. Give me a fucking break. Breath of fresh air. Nobody, I guarantee you nobody in NXT, nobody at that performance center said that their visit there was a breath of fresh air. According to Fightful Select, there is a lot of relief right now <laughs> in the NXT locker room. It was said that many NXT superstars were worried about finding themselves on the chopping block after a bad first impression with Vince McMahon. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. You don't think they had eyes everywhere? I don't like the way he looks. I don't like the way she looks. What was that person's name? What was his name? What was her name? Cut him. Cut him. They were clearly keeping an eye on who's advancing, who's not, who to cut, who to keep. That's the only reason why they were there. They weren't scouting for the main roster. They weren't scouting at all for the main roster. In the end, McMahon wasn't seen by a lot of people. Yeah, scouting mission, right? <laughs> he wasn't seen by, where was he? Where was he? He was hiding in the fucking shadows. He was hiding behind Nick Khan's multi-million dollar fucking mansion. Where was he? Was he hiding behind fucking slob-like, fucking amoeba-like Bruce Pritchard in the Performance Center? Give me a break. McMahon wasn't seen by a lot of people. If anything, they only caught a short glimpse of him there. A couple of members of the locker room said that they made themselves nervous for no reason with Vince McMahon's visit. Several of those that were there said they really, they really were relieved when they realized they were just training as usual like they do on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. It was also reported that not all NXT talent were told to be there on Thursday. That being said, some people didn't even realize what was going on with Vince McMahon's visit. And you know what that means. Triple H called up his uh, pride and joy, some of the talent that he is very scared of losing. He called up certain talents and he said, hey, yo, Johnny, hey, yo, Tommaso, 
Hey, yo, this one, th that one, EO, stay home. Raquel, stay home. We don't want Vince. We don't want Bruce. We don't want Johnny Laurinaitis, People Power, and Nick Khan to get a hold of you and get a glimpse at you because if they see you training, they're going to call upon you first and foremost to go to the main roster. And you know what? I can't afford to lose any of you at all. Not even one of you I can afford to lose. So I'm sure Vince McMahon told his, his true talent, his fucking elite, I'm sure Triple H spoke to his favorites well before this was happening. Stay home. We don't need you. Take the day off. Go walk the dog. Spend the day with your wife. Spend the day by the pool. Go do what you got to do. You're giving, you're giving uh, me, you know, the benefit of keeping NXT alive by keeping you home. Just go and enjoy the day. Go to Disney. Go grab a few drinks. Go have a nice lunch on the company. Whatever the case may be. He told them to stay home because he didn't want Vince to see what was going on. Hey, I what about her? You, she wasn't on the internal list of people. Who is this over here? That's exactly what this, this entire trip was a fucking farce, man. This entire trip was bullshit for Vince McMahon. I don't even have a fucking I owed a, a I owed of a clue what happened down there because clearly I wasn't there. But I mean this is like this is like so easy to see what happened here. They went down there to scout. Give me a fucking break. They went down there to scout which fucking department they're going to be cutting next. Get out of here, man. Speaking of cuts, Ruby Rod, she was cut. She may have possibly revealed her WWE, or post, rather, WWE name. Many fans expect her to go by the name of Heidi Lovelace, but she doesn't want to really go by that name. She said in a recent interview that she would love to keep the Ruby Riot name. So she's going now on Instagram by Ruby Soho. This is actually the name of a song by the American punk rock band Rancid. As of this writing, she has not changed that information on Twitter. This is where she noted that the Ruby name means more to her at this point than the Heidi Lovelace name at this time. Obviously, we don't know where she's going to end up, but the name was given to her by the people who trained her. So that is the reason why she wants that name. Riot said most people couldn't properly pronounce the name and she wasn't a fan of the Heidi Lovelace name anyway. Ruby Riot joined WWE and was placed on NXT back in 2016. Riot made her main roster debut alongside Liv Morgan and Sarah Logan by attacking both Becky Lynch and Naomi in 2017. She was released earlier this month due to budget cuts. She is definitely going to end up and be successful no matter where she goes, whether she goes to Impact, AEW, MLW, Ring of Honor. No matter what she does, she's going to be successful. She's very good at what she does. She's got a great look, and everybody loved her in WWE, and that was the one release that a lot of people looked at as being one of the saddest releases because everybody universally loved her backstage, except clearly WWE creative. I don't know why. But I said, if you want to make her a superstar, Bring her to AEW and build that division around her, man. She's got so much more to give. They got a women's battle royal, casino battle royal happening at All Out. That was already announced by Tony Khan and AEW. You have her come in at number 21 and be the Joker card in that battle royal, and you have her go on and have a great career in AEW. That is the best place for her to go. You build that division around her, man. That is where their priority needs to be. It's not where it needs to be at all right now. I think they've taken a step backwards with Britt Baker and Nyla Rose being her first feudish champion for Britt Baker. They really haven't done much of anything. But fans are also coming back, so I do expect them to ramp up that women's division regardless. But if WWE let her go, this should be one of the easiest signings for AEW. And I said it from the, from the jump. If you're going to look at somebody, they obviously can't take everybody. But if you're going to sign somebody, Alistair is absolutely a priority and Ruby Riot's the other. Ruby Riot is the other. I even made a, a case for Mickey James, but she's doing her own thing. Good for her. But Ruby Riot, he's already got Andrade. So that's one. Alistair and Ruby, absolute no brainers for Tony Khan. Hopefully she ends up in AEW. I think that's where she'll be most beneficial to that particular division. And finally, guys, there's an interesting theory on why WWE changed Nikki Cross's last name to Nikki Ash. Whatever the fuck that means. Almost the superhero, Nikki Ash. The superhero gimmick is something that she pitched. I don't believe that at all. Something that she pitched a while back and got it approved by Vince McMahon. This is either a bullshit lie or maybe she did. And I'm thinking here, this is why pro wrestlers do not have creative control over their characters. Because we end up with shit like this. It's not good. 
Got it approved by Vince McMahon, but the name change had fans wondering if it was something she wanted or if there was a conflict with an NXT star that is about to move up to the main roster. You can see where I'm going with this. Brian Alvarez was asked on Wrestling Observer Live this week if Karrion Cross moving up to Raw or SmackDown soon could have something to do with Nikki's name change. Alvarez said, and I quote, that could be part of it. One of the keys is that they're spelled differently. So I don't know how militant Vince is going to be about having two crosses on the main roster when one is spelled one way and the other is spelled another way. My guess is that you're correct because Karrion Cross is doing tryout matches on main event and then Nikki Cross the same week gets a new name. So I would not be in the least bit surprised. I'm not reporting that, everybody, but I would not be surprised if that is why she got her new name. Alvarez doesn't have to report it because that's exactly what the case is. Nikki Cross got a name change because Karrion Cross is about to debut on the same brand that has Nikki Cross. This has been done before time and time and time again. I don't remember the one instance that just recently happened, but I believe this just happened. WWE loves to change names. They love to cut first names from people. They love to shorten names. This is a Vince McMahon thing. He's got a fucking hard on for changing people's names. So something so blatant staring you in the face, Nikki Cross, and we got this Carrion Cross from NXT. We can't have, we can't have two crosses on the main roster. Bruce, we gotta change this. It's exactly what happened. That's exactly the fucking case. You'll never know the reason to that, but that's exactly what it is. So whoever said this to Alvarez was 100% correct. He says, I'm not gonna report that, but that is exactly what the case is. This is WWE we're talking about, folks. Leave it to them to do something so petty and so stupid like that. Why would you not believe it? It's exactly the reason why Nikki Cross is now Nikki Ash Ketchum on fucking Monday Night Raw. I don't know whether she's a pro wrestler or she's going out to the open fields chasing fucking wild Pokemon. Fucking ridiculous gimmick. Ridiculous gimmick. Anyway, I'm getting the hell out of here, man. Thank you so very much for all your support. If you enjoyed the podcast, if you enjoyed the video, let me know what you're thinking down below with a comment in the comment section. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at JD from NY206. Go hit that subscribe button if you have not done so. Hit that thumbs up and go check out all the other content on the channel, on the homepage. Everything is right there on the homepage if you missed any of the content this week. I'll be back next week with a brand new week of content. Until then, guys, have a great holiday. Stay safe, and I'll be back right here live with the Monday Night Raw post show after Monday Night Raw on Monday. See you guys later.